Johns Hopkins Medicine. Known for groundbreaking research, teaching, and medical care. Welcome to Facebook Live from Johns Hopkins Medicine. I'm Elizabeth Tracy. And I'm Alana Ikau. I'm a craniofacial orthodontist. Jordan Steinberg, pediatric and craniofacial plastic surgeon. July, of course, is National Cleft Lip and Palate and Craniofacial Awareness Month. Who knew? And so the first thing I'd like to talk about is I was personally astonished to learn just how very many babies are born with cleft lip and palate. Who would like to address that first? Sure, I can uh, go ahead there. Uh, cleft lip and palate is a very, very common uh, condition. And here in the United States, it's about one in 700 to one in 1,000 uh, babies that are born uh, uh, every year with, uh, with a cleft palate, uh, a cleft lip and or palate. Uh, and um, uh, it really ends up being the second or third most common birth anomaly uh, that we see. So here at Johns Hopkins, uh, which is uh, one of the major birthing centers uh, in the state of Maryland, we certainly have a lot of babies uh, on an annual basis that come to see us uh, in our cleft and craniofacial team with uh, cleft lip and or palate. And uh, my understanding is that one of the first things that happens is that they see an orthodontist. So maybe we could hear your perspective on that. Sure, uh, when a baby is born with cleft lip and palate, a process called nasoalveolar molding, or NAM for short, is done. Uh, an appliance that looks like a retainer is used to move the gum segments in the mouth closer together. It also moves the lip segments closer together because there can be a gap between the gum and the lip segments. And it also gives the nose a more ideal symmetric form because the nose can be asymmetrical um, and have an abnormal morphology. And this process is started within the first few days of life and can last three to six months depending on the severity of the cleft. And the goal is to uh, give the mouth and the nose a more normal anatomy to give the surgeon a better starting point for surgery. Now, does this compromise this brand new infant's ability to feed? Uh, no, it doesn't. It actually makes it easier for a lot of babies to feed. So babies with cleft lip and palate cannot breastfeed because they can't create a suction in their mouth because there's an opening in the roof of the mouth. Uh, but the appliance provides a hard surface for the baby to uh, squeeze milk out of a bottle and there are special bottles that they use, but it typically actually makes it easier to feed. And is that appliance something that you also are responsible for fitting? Uh, yes, I make the appliance, I fit it, and there are weekly adjustments to the appliance. So every week the baby comes in and I make small adjustments to the appliance and over time uh, it moves the gum and lip segments closer together. When would a baby then have his or her first visit with a surgeon? Thanks for the question. Uh, you know, we have uh, a good fortune here at Hopkins now of having uh, an orthodontist full time. And so it's been of great benefit to include the orthodontist as well as our nurse coordinator uh, at even the prenatal consultation. So today uh, we have very good success even at the screening 20 week ultrasound uh, for pregnant moms. If a cleft lip uh, and or palate is identified at that time, we tr try to set them up with a visit uh, right around that time period with our team to help uh, get some information about uh, what may be ahead. And we found that many families uh, really benefit from that experience because of the preparedness that they can gain uh, prior to the birth of their child. Um, it makes it less overwhelming on the day of birth uh, to not have to get all of that information at once. And some of the things that we concentrate on uh, are feeding, as we just mentioned, uh, particularly if there is a cleft of the palate involved, that's when we uh, have a need for a special type of bottle. So we will give that bottle to families at the time of the prenatal visit. We will uh, <clears throat> meet with the orthodontist because if the baby does in fact have a complete cleft that extends through the lip and palate, then he or she may benefit from that process of molding the lip uh, prior to the first surgery. And then we kind of transition into a discussion about you know, what are the, uh, the, the major uh, surgical uh, milestones during that first year of life, and that would include uh, repair of the cleft lip, usually around three to six months of age, uh, and then the palate surgery, which is gonna follow that somewhere uh, between nine and 12 months of age, so a little bit later, 
just before the speech uh, is coming uh, into play. I just want to remind all of our listeners to please go ahead and send us your questions on Facebook Live. We are absolutely happy to address those. And I'd like to go back <coughs> then to this idea that you brought up that, in fact, a lot of the time, cleft lip or palate or both of those together are discerned by ultrasound at the 20th week of pregnancy. Is that right? Yes, the, the so-called level two ultrasound uh, that all uh, moms will get uh, as a normal screening uh, today has a very, very good degree of accuracy of picking up a cleft lip. Uh, sometimes the baby's hand may be covering the face and you may not get a good view. But oftentimes, if there is a cleft lip present, it, it will be detected as part of that screening ultrasound. And then we may get word in our team uh, about that family and and offer to them the chance to come in and, and meet with our team early to, to get additional information. So many, it seems like, procedures being done in utero these days, but I guess no repair of that particular thing in utero yet. Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. There was, uh, there was a lot of research into that a couple of decades ago, uh, with the idea being that uh, fetuses actually have uh, could have the potential for scarless wound healing. And so there was a lot of interest in, uh, in, in looking at that uh, concept. But of course, there's, there are many risks involved with uh, considering such an idea. And although it's been done in some other fields, we're not quite there yet uh, in terms of facial surgeries, uh, you know, with the risk-benefit balance. But uh, scarring uh, is one of the things that comes up in our discussions all the time and how to optimize and make that uh, cleft scar as minimal as possible. Well, probably both of you are able to address that issue, I suspect, because I bet the orthodontist is involved also. Uh, we're involved initially with the nasoalveolar molding process, and the goal is to bring the lip and gum segments closer together, and by bringing the segments together, there's less tension on those lip segments during the surgery, and that results in a more minimal scar. Are there revisions that take place? I think there are, right, after these initial surgeries take place? Right, I was, I was gonna say one of the questions that comes up all the time is, you know, how many surgeries might my child need? Uh, and we, we do focus in those initial uh, clinic visits on what happens during the first year of life when there's a lip repair and the palate repair for a child with cleft lip and palate. But it's conceivable that that child may not require any uh, surgeries after that uh, for quite a while until the permanent teeth start coming in. And that's where uh, you know, I then have very close uh, working relationship with uh, Dr. Ekow as we start getting involved in the orthodontics part. Because as the teeth start coming in, uh, we need to make sure that around the area of the cleft that there's sufficient bone that the teeth can then uh, establish their roots appropriately uh, and so the next major surgery uh, might be the reconstruction of the jaw to place some additional bone so that the, uh, the teeth can come in properly. And so it's really a, a concerted effort at that point amongst all the teams. And there may be additional surgeries for some refinements of the lip and the nose, uh, or uh, as um, uh, uh, Alana will explain as well, as we get into the teenage years, if the patient were to develop an underbite, which is, which is fairly common, uh, there may be a surgery for the jaw that's even needed uh, down the line. And this, again, can apply not only to patients who have cleft lip and palate, but also a number of other uh, craniofacial conditions or congenital uh, issues that involve the facial bone. So there's, there's a lot of interplay between uh, us as plastic surgeons, as well as our ENT colleagues and our speech colleagues and the dentists and orthodontists. So there's really a, uh, a multidisciplinary effort. Clearly, this is a place to come if a whole breadth of that kind of expertise is needed. How often does that happen when a child is born with cleft lip and palate? Um, you know, we have uh, multidisciplinary teams that we're both a part of, uh, both the cleft uh, team as well as the craniofacial team, and we have slightly different specialists involved in either. But our aim is always to make it so that it can be a one-stop shop for the families who are coming in so that they don't have to coordinate on their own, uh, making an appointment with uh, half a dozen different providers uh, on an annual basis because it can be quite a lot. 
Uh, and so, um, uh, you know, that's certainly one of our missions is, is to make this a process whereby it's easy to keep tabs on all of these dimensions of their development. On the spectrum then of cleft lip and palate, how often do they really severe abnormalities that require multiple surgeries? And it sounds like multiple surgeries over many years. How often does that particular defect take place? We tend to say that the uh, average uh, scenario, let's say, of a, of a patient with a cleft lip and palate might require something like five surgeries over the course of their uh, childhood. But we've certainly seen patients that have that have required more trips to the operating room. But I have to say, and just as Ilana pointed out er earlier, we certainly try to uh, minimize the number of major surgeries that a child will go through. And so all of these efforts to coordinate amongst specialists are really focused on trying to optimize the conditions so that each time we do a repair or do a procedure, we're doing it uh, under as ideal conditions as possible to really minimize the number of, of procedures overall that they may, they may need. Ilana, we've been talking about cleft lip and palate as if those are a unit, they always go together. Is that true? Uh, they don't always go together. Uh, sometimes only the lip is affected, sometimes only the palate is affected, and sometimes both the lip and palate are affected. Uh, also, sometimes clefts are unilateral, which means that there is an opening on either the right or left side, and sometimes they're bilateral, which means that there is an opening on both the right and left sides. Uh, and clefts can also range in severity from a small notch to an opening that extends to the nose. So there's a whole spectrum. There are a lot of uh, different types of clefts. They're not all the same. Is there ever a time when those, those kinds of abnormalities that you see, is there ever a progression after a child's born or is what you see pretty much what you get? I'd say what you see is what you get. You can tell what type of cleft a baby has when they're born. Uh, and the goal is uh, through the appliances that we use and the surgeries to minimize that, but it, it doesn't progress as a baby gets older. And I would just add that, um, you know, because we certainly spent uh, a lot of time talking about uh, the typical cleft lip and palate, there are, there are some other craniofacial conditions where there can be changes over the growth period. Um, for example, there are some uh, patients that we see whereby the tissues uh, start to diminish over time and the, the bone structure and the soft tissues on that side of the face, for example, uh, can undergo atrophy or they shrink down over time. That's one of the conditions that we see. Or other conditions of overgrowth where the bone may actually get much larger over time. So these are less common than the standard uh, cleft lip and palate, but all part of the craniofacial spectrum that we may see in our team. Talk to me about families and whether this is a condition that if you have one child who's been born with cleft lip and palate, can you expect another? So a good question. Uh, you know, we have this reported incidence that we always cite of about one in 1,000 babies being born with a cleft, uh, which translates to a 0.1% uh, incidence of having cleft lip or palate. But we know that if um, that individual then has children of his, uh, of, you know, his or her own, that uh, basically the, the incidence of having uh, a cleft in, in the next uh, generation is certainly increased. And, and that number uh, becomes something like 4%, so from 0.1% to 4%, four, to 4%, so a 40-fold uh, increase uh, in the chances. So uh, if it is a parent that has a cleft or a sibling that has a cleft, you know, that certainly increases the, uh, the likelihood. So, there, so there's certainly a hereditary influence in addition to other factors. It's, it's a combination. And we know, for example, that spina bifida, which is a condition, of course, where the spine, when it's growing, things don't close properly around it, has been reduced a lot by the addition of certain vitamins to like grain products and so forth here in the US. What about the development, the actual development of cleft lip and palate, is that related? And so it's, it's interesting, we've been studying, uh, and that question comes up a lot during some of the prenatal consultations and things like this, and we, you know, we've been studying uh, cleft and craniofacial conditions for, for many, many years, and, and for cleft lip and palate, perhaps a century or more. And we know that uh, there are some associations with nutrient deficiencies, uh, with 
uh, for example, a, a use of certain anticonvulsant medications by mothers or tobacco use, et cetera. There, there, there are associations, but we don't have uh, definitive evidence that supplementing the diet, let's say, uh, on a population basis uh, can, you know, has, has resulted in significant changes. It, it's been pretty consistent over time, uh, those numbers uh, in terms of the, the incidence of cleft lip or palate. Uh, it does have some variation uh, in terms of geography, so there are certain areas of the world where it's more common than in other places. I'm guessing that sometimes you have to really comfort parents and say, look, this is really nothing that you could have done differently. You didn't take your prenatal vitamins or whatever. Yes, yes, that does come up uh, quite a bit too. And, and we, we do try to remind the families that uh, having this uh, finding uh, on an ultrasound, for example, doesn't reflect that there was a particular problem with the pregnancy or anything that was done wrong. Uh, there sometimes can be those thoughts or those feelings. And so um, that, that, does, that does come up from time to time. I wonder if you both would reflect for me what you would say is the outlook for a child when you first see them. I know that there's a range of severities, but it's sounding to me like you're both really very confident that things are going to be fine. Absolutely. I always tell parents that this is a treatable condition. I see so many children uh, from the day that they're born until they're in their 20s, and I just see them thrive and do so well. And, you know, they're just like their friends. They do go through a lot of uh, appointments and surgeries, but it's treatable, and, and they really do very well. I would, uh, sure. I would echo that as well. I mean, I think one of the greatest things about what we do is the ability to follow uh, our patients and, and see them from the time they come in as, as babies to the time that they uh, graduate high school and go off to college, which is kind of coincident with a graduation from our team because we really do follow them for many years. And so we're, we're really attuned to their whole development, you know, their, their uh, psychosocial well-being as well as all their medical needs. And so, you know, we have that privilege of, of seeing them uh, over that period of time. And I would say that from that perspective, we certainly know that, um, you know, these conditions haven't stopped uh, many of our patients from achieving anything that they, that they wish. That's a beautiful message. Anything else either of you would like to add? Um, I'd just like to add a note too, that one, one of the questions that, that comes up a lot is about, um, a coverage for these insurance coverage for these procedures and and of course we have uh, differences with the way that we have medical care in the United States versus other countries and a question that, that sometimes is on people's minds is whether any of these procedures are, are considered uh, cosmetic and you know I think we, we all certainly feel that these procedures are, are reconstructive in nature we're, we're, as we just mentioned we're trying to really uh, rebuild and restore uh, a sense of uh, of, of whole self and, and of, of the normal anatomy. Uh, and, um, you know, most of the families we encourage very early on to check with their insurer about, uh, you know, their care plans uh, in a special needs circumstance. But for even those families that don't have uh, plans that uh, have a lot of information about that or where they feel that there may be less support, there are statewide programs, uh, and especially here in Maryland and many other states, where families can get those resources. And our coordinator, uh, Kim Seifert, who's been working with the CLEF team for over 20 years, uh, has helped many families get that statewide assistance that they need. And, and that has supported them through not only the surgical care for me, but also the, the dental and orthodontic aspects as well. That is very good news. On that up note then, thank you both so very much for joining me. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's Facebook Live from Johns Hopkins Medicine.